turn things over now um, to Dr. O'Hare, who will introduce our next speaker. Thanks, Matt. Um, so it is my um, it is my pleasure to um, welcome Dr. Fahad Saeed um, to our grand rounds. Um, he is a nephrologist and palliative care specialist at the University of Rochester in New York. Um, he received his undergraduate degree in medicine and surgery from the National University of Sciences in Pakistan. He completed residency and chief residency at the University of Illinois in Champaign, Urbana. Uh, he did nephrology fellowship at Dartmouth and palliative care fellowship at the University of Rochester, where he's currently an assistant professor in the tenure track. His research, and th these is his description, he, his research focuses on the nuances of physician-patient communication, um, health-related decision-making, um, healthcare utilization, and quality of life um, for patients with chronic kidney disease. Um, his research su support comes from the um, NIH via a K23 award on dialysis decision-making. Um, he also has grants from the ASN and the Renal Research Institute. Um, and uh, he is gonna talk with us today uh, about the patient, the family, and the physician, the three phases of advanced care planning in um, patients um, receiving dialysis. Fahad, welcome, and thank you for uh, being willing to talk with us. Thank you. Grateful to be here. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep, sounds good. All right. Well, right at the outset, let me introduce you to Mr. James. James and I met during my fellowship at Dartmouth in, in the winter of 2011. He was in his 80s. He was tall. He was thin. He had thick white hair. He was an ex-college professor who had won numerous awards uh, for his excellent teaching skills. He also volunteered at a local orphanage uh, and he continued to volunteer until his recent diagnosis of lung cancer. James also had diabetes, hypertension and CKD stage four. While receiving chemotherapy, his GFR had worsened and he presented to the hospital with complaints of shortness of breath, fatigue and metallic taste in his mouth. I was about to meet with him. I entered the room, did my assessment, and James was feeling very weak. In a, in a low tone of voice, he asked me, Dr. Saeed, how much more time do I have? I didn't know what to say. I ended up saying, I don't know. James said, no problem. I felt embarrassed. As a doctor, I was supposed to know everything. But he was the one who ended up comforting me. Fortunately, in the later part of the day, my attending took over the situation and in a very comforting and nurturing way, he persuaded James to initiate dialysis. James's wife had died a couple of years ago and his two sons were not involved in his care. But frankly, we never called his son and informed them about the situation. Following dialysis initiation, James had several admissions related to various reasons. And during one of the admissions, he died in the ICU all alone after receiving CPR. The prognosis question was never answered. Advanced care planning was never done. 10 years later, I still wish I could have done a better job. The patient, the family, and the physician, three phases of advanced care planning in patients receiving dialysis. That's the topic of today's presentation. We'll start uh, our journey together by uh, talking briefly about what's advanced care planning and why is it necessary. Uh, then I'll present data from the U-State study uh, that tried to answer the question, do family members know their loved one's wishes? I'm grateful to Dr. O'Hare for her leadership uh, on this paper. And in the last part of this talk, 
I will try to convey an empathic understanding of why it is so difficult to engage in advanced care planning uh, conversations. My wish is that by having awareness, uh, that having awareness will lead to some action and change. So advanced care planning is a, is a process of discussion and planning by a competent person uh, where he or she addresses to, their, to the future clinicians and everyone expressing wishes and values regarding medical treatments in the event of becoming incompetent, holds the weight of law and is enforceable. The documents that come out of uh, that process are called advanced directives. And there are two types of advanced directives, decisional, such as uh, living will, uh, or, or, or most or post, or appointment directives, such as healthcare proxy for health related matters, power of attorney for financial matters. And it is important to, to engage in, in the advanced care planning process because the latest study uh, published in one of the most prestigious medical journals done over decades and hundreds of years has shown 100% of us will die. Evidence-based medicine. And it's also important to, 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 to do advanced care planning because, because that's what our patients want. In our study of 423 dialysis patients, 80% uh, were comfortable having end of life discussions with their family members. 63% uh, uh, were comfortable having these conversations with the nephrology staff. 67% had thought about what might happen to their illness in the future. 10% recalled having prognostic discussions with their doctor, while 78% thought it was important to be informed about prognosis. In our study, almost half of the patients didn't know if they had completed a living will or any form of any advanced directive. It's important to uh, engage in these conversations because the cost of end-of-life care for our patients are much higher than other chronic disease populations. 63% are admitted to ICU in the last 90 days. They receive complex care and rates of hospice enrollment are really low. Unfortunately, uh, majority of the times, the default of the medical system if the patient's wishes are unknown, is to give invasive and potentially burdensome treatments. However, if patients have completed advanced directives, their chances of receiving gold concordant care are high. They're more likely to have control over the dying process, less likely to have a painful dying process, and there are more chances of palliative care and hospice utilization. Family members who are engaged in this process are less likely to experience guilt and distress. But the reality is uh, that majority of the older adults receiving dialysis uh, in their final admission uh, are incapacitated. So most of the time, the burden of decision-making uh, lies on family's shoulders. So then that raises the question, if, if, the, if goal concordant care is the, is the cornerstone of person-centered care, do family members have knowledge of their loved one's uh, wishes? So this study uh, uh, was, was, was done from uh, uh, data from the U state study, which comprises uh, 1,000 patients receiving dialysis who had completed a survey uh, on various end-of-life care issues. Uh, this survey was uh, administered in person. And these patients uh, were mainly, uh, came from outpatient facilities uh, in Seattle and Nashville. 
And then they were asked to identify family members who were most involved in the care. In turn, these family members were approached via phone and were administered a survey to understand family members' uh, knowledge of patients' treatment preferences, values, decisional role, and prognostic expectations. I didn't show uh, th uh, those data here, but for patients with enrolled, uh, there was no significant difference uh, between the patients with enrolled family members versus those whose family members didn't enroll. But the points I wanna highlight here, that the mean age of the patients was almost 61 years, while for the enrolled family members was almost 55 years. And there was a decent representation of African-American and other minority populations. Uh, this sample for both patients and enrolled family members uh, had subjects with relatively high educational attainment. 40% of the uh, caregivers identified in the study were spouses, 26% were children, 60% lived with the patient, and almost 66% uh, spent most or all of the time caring for the patient. Two thirds of the family members, uh, they felt extremely or quite a bit confident in knowing their loved one's wishes. We asked the family members if they've had prior conversations uh, with the patients on the following topics uh, about healthcare proxy, uh, I can't see it. Give me one second. Almost 70% uh, had, have had uh, conversations about healthcare proxy. Uh, 41% have had conversations about uh, presence of a healthcare proxy document. 52% about situations making life not worth living. 63% about treatment preferences. 27% about stopping dialysis. And 32% about hospice. Now, remember, we, we had asked the similar questions uh, to the patients as well. So we did Kappa statistic to see the agreement between patients and family members' responses. So just to give you an idea about Kappa statistic, less than zero, no agreement, zero to 0 0.2, slight agreement, and so on and so forth. So agreement on question related to CPR, was almost uh, fair regarding breathing machine, slight. Patient's values, slight agreement. Preferred place of death, slight agreement. Preferred decisional role, slight agreement. Prognosis, slight agreement. And all of these findings are statistically significant except uh, the preferred place of death. So in, in this sample of highly involved family members who are highly educated, uh, we observe uh, a poor to slight concordance between patients and family members' responses. Family members lacked detailed understanding of patients' wishes, and we ran uh, similar analysis on healthcare proxies or family members who thought they were very confident uh, in knowing patients' wishes and results were no different. Again, I'd like to highlight that conversations uh, about hospice and dialysis discontinuation uh, occurred in only one third of the cases. So the, these findings should be interpreted uh, with the following limitations in mind. And it was a relatively small sample size with a relatively low response rate, although it's 
consistent with other studies uh, among caregivers. 10% patients had no family members that the study team could reach out. So advanced care planning in these patients is, is, is particularly necessary. And we ask questions at one point in time, and we know that family members' preferences may change over time. We only study outpatient hemodialysis patients, so it's unsure if these findings will be applicable to hospitalized patients and so forth. But given uh, what we have, it seems like that in order to deliver goal concordant care to patients receiving dialysis, families should be a part of the advanced care planning process. And not only that, they should be prepared for their future role. And it, it, it's an emotional process and it can be difficult uh, for family members to be fully prepared for their future role. But perhaps uh, knowing patients' broader goals could be a good start. And for those goals of care conversations, uh, conversations about prognosis, hospice, and dialysis, discontinuation should be uh, parts of those conversations. Now, in the, in the last part of uh, uh, th this talk, uh, I, I really hope to uh, uh, convey what we all preach that advanced care planning is necessary, but it is difficult to engage in these conversations. Uh, let's face it, whenever we are engaged in a conversation about death with the patient, we're exposed to our own mortality. The literature from psychoanalysis is clear on this. You know, we get exposed to our own mortality, we become anxious, and then we avoid these conversations. I remember a time uh, when my youngest was just born. There was a night when I woke up and I worried about my children. I was acutely aware of my mortality. And during that time, I was very afraid of, of my own death. I, I never engaged uh, in conversations about advanced care planning with my patients. I had excuses that English is not my first language. I'm not good at communication skills. I don't have time. It's not my job. I don't know the prognosis. I worried uh, that I'm going to take away hope from my patients. As a result, I felt morally distressed, like many of our fellows uh, who feel the same way. So I, I left uh, uh, my nephrology practice and, and did a year of palliative care fellowship. And only by reflection, exposure, and practice, I, I realized that conversations about good death are as important as conversations about a good life. Let me, let me introduce you to, to, to Jerome. Jerome and I met in my kidney clinic. It was a busy day. Uh, I, I entered the room. Jerome was sitting in a chair wearing blue jeans, black polo shirt. As soon as I entered the room, remember it was a very busy day, but as soon as I entered the room, I felt peace. And I took notice of those feelings. And over the next 20, 20 25 minutes, I examined him, did my assessment, reviewed labs, and then intrigued by my own emotions, I asked him, are you a religious or a spiritual person? Jerome asked me, why? I said, when I'm in your presence, I feel peace. And typically I feel this way in the presence of very spiritual people. James, J Jerome smiled. He said, it's because I don't sweat the small stuff. 
I became even more curious. And I, I said, what do you mean by that? Then Jerome told me a story. When he was in his 50s, one day his son and his family were visiting him. Now, Jerome was sitting on the first floor of his two-story house, enjoying his breakfast, reading a morning newspaper. Suddenly he heard his grandkids and his daughter-in-law screaming. Jerome had no idea what was happening. So he immediately rushed upstairs and there he saw something that would be the worst nightmare of any parent. Jerome's son had hung himself. Jerome said, Doc, over the next several minutes, I had to take care of my children, take care of my granddaughter, call 911, and untie my son. Once I had done that, I'm fearless. I know exactly why I am here in this world. I am here to take care of my grandkids and help other children live better lives. Now, Jerome's kidneys were working at GFR was 10 ml per minute. And he chose against dialysis and he's on a conservative kidney management pathway. Supporting him uh, in complete, completing advanced directives was meaningful for me and for him both. But in practice, we see two types of patients, one with high fear of death uh, and one with a high fear of losing quality of life. And we have to sort of gauge uh, uh, at a gut level, uh, What's this patient's goals? What are these patient's preferences? What's their story? Because frankly, patients have incomplete understanding of these issues. They think it's physician's responsibility to uh, engage in these conversations. And there's a natural human tendency to delay the decisions. But I showed you the data. Patients do want to have these conversations, but it's not easy though. What about family members? It's equally difficult for family members to have these conversations. At one family gathering, my mother, who's approaching her 70s, said to all of us, I don't know how long I'm gonna be with you all. As soon as he uttered those words, my siblings and I immediately said, no mom, you'll be okay. I was a trained palliative care physician at that time. And I could not discuss my mom's end of life wishes with her. Something that I do on a regular basis with my patients. I could not get the truth out because I was so afraid of losing her. I felt very inadequate and rather guilty. So I kept thinking about it for several months. And then one day during an evening walk, I asked my mom, mom, how's it possible? One day we're here in this world and the next we're not. My mom accepted that invitation and opened up to me. By discussing her end of life wishes, a strange thing happened. My fear of losing her went down. And now I am more committed to honor her wishes. So this process is not easy. There's a lot of vulnerability in it, but Perhaps families should be encouraged. That connection and respecting their loved ones is on the other end of vulnerability and fear.
my mentor and one of the pioneers in palliative care, Dr. Timothy Quill says, you die the way you live your life. Makes sense. How could you change in the last few days of your life? If I live a life full of fear and avoidance, that's the kind of death I'm going to likely have. But if I live a life full of acceptance, joy, and, and no avoidance, then I'll be better prepared for the last chapter of my life. So I want to ask you, what does living mean for each of you and your parents, patients? What does dying mean for each of you and your patients? Are these two different things or the separate ends of the same rope called life? I'll leave you with these two questions for reflection, but I'll be happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Saeed, um, for that provocative talk. Um, we do have some time for questions. Um, so people may either uh, write in the chat or use the raise their hand function. Um, sure. Maybe I'll just launch the first question, which is, you know, you've shown us uh, some of your prior and current work. You know, what are the next steps in your kind of research pathway questions that you're gonna be tackling upcoming? So the idea is to, I mean, we've, we've raised the issue, uh, but how to tackle it, uh, how to solve the problem. So we're, 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 I'm almost towards the tail end of completing a pilot intervention for both uh, patients who have advanced CKD and are above uh, 75 years of age and their caregivers. And the idea is to help them uh, with dialysis decision-making and uh, advanced care planning. So that's sort of the next step. Then we're doing an, another intervention for, uh, it's, it's a pilot uh, intervention to train physicians and uh, uh, communication skills so they can help patients uh, make person-centered decision-making. Looks like Leah has a question. Go ahead, Leah. Um, that was a beautiful, that was a beautiful talk, um, Farad. Thank you. I was just wondering, at what point in the sort of CKD dialysis career do you recommend or do you personally bring up uh, um bring up this stuff? Like, do you, do you wait until you know a patient for a month or two if they're on dialysis? Do you do it while they're at CKD-5? Um, which office visit do you do it at? And since time is such an issue, do you think it would, it, it would be good if we all set aside, you know, an hour visit or an extra long visit with our dialysis patients to do this at intervals? So that's a great question. So uh, I, I'm, I'm blessed in a way that in the palliative care clinic, you know, there's a system in place uh, for, for me to help patients uh, complete advanced directives. Uh, so every patient who I see in the palliative care clinic, almost every patient, uh, I help them complete advanced directives. Uh, I mean, in dialysis units, as, as you know, by, by I think we, we were supposed to help patients uh, complete advanced directives. So all of those patients, uh, I help them complete advanced uh, directives. For CKD patients uh, in the clinic, I have at a gut level, uh, various reminders for myself whenever I'm helping the patient make decisions about dialysis, whenever a patient's about to uh, start dialysis, uh, or whenever there's, a, there's an acute event, uh, these are the situations in which I tend to bring up these issues. Now I've started a new practice. Uh, whenever one of my patients uh, start dialysis, I bring them back for a follow-up visit. I can't bill for it, but I just do a check-in and I, I say how things are and, and just help them adjust 
to a new lifestyle and raise these issues of mortality, prognosis, and so forth. Thank you. It's like Dan uh, Lamb has a question. Uh, go ahead, Dan. Thanks, Hi. Thanks Hi, for your great talk. Um, I was just wondering, you know, where do you see dialysis interdisciplinary staff in engaging in the advanced care planning process and walking with patients and families through this whole process? I mean, it's done more on an ad hoc basis, at least in my experience, but, uh, you know, how do you see um, a better way to formalize this and get everyone to be working uh, as a team on this? You, you know, you've, you've raised a really good, good question. And uh, I, I think we have the infrastructure you know, there's a social worker in dialysis units, there's, there are physicians, there are nurse practitioners, but the system is not designed to support these conversations. Uh, the quality of these conversations in, in my biased uh, assessment is, is relatively poor. So the individuals have to be really motivated and inspired to take on that challenge. So I, I don't have any easy fix for you or any easy solution, but other than the fact that this is the right thing to do and we, we need to do it. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Saeed, for joining us here uh, this morning remotely. It's one of the, one of the benefits of uh, remote Grand Rounds these days. So thank you so much. Um, and uh, also to Anne for uh, connecting us. So uh, to everyone else, I hope everyone has a, a great weekend um, and we'll see you all back uh, next week. Thank you and nice to meet all of you.